for exercise choice. And then in terms of heart rate during that that period, I mean, how much attention should we pay to this? I, the kind of very broad um, prescriptive I've thrown out on this podcast a few times based on my read of the literature is for most people that are oriented toward health, including people that are working on size and strength gains, hypertrophy and strength, of course, um, that getting 150 to 180 minutes of so-called zone two cardio, yeah. um, you know, can just have a com- just barely have a conversation. But if one were to push any harder, you wouldn't be able to that kind of thing. It's just a as a kind of a generic recommendation that almost everybody should follow in order to just keep their cardiovascular system healthy. But I know there's a lot of nuance there. And some people would like to be able to run continuously for an hour at totally. speed, right? Um, yep. uh, obviously not sprinting, but w- what are some of the um, finer finer points on yep. long distance endurance? So I and how to... often should one do it? Okay, uh, uh, frequency you could do it is daily. Right? Even when strength, doing strength and hypertrophy. No question. Training. Well, that I think is an important point for people to hear because a lot of people think that they are going to greatly diminish their strength and hypertrophy yeah. gains, as it's often called, um, by doing in zone two cardio. Zone I, two, you have almost no ability to block your hypertrophy. Zone two, truly, if it's really within that category, if you're talking about conversational pace, um, there is very, in fact, there's strong reason to think that is not going to influence hypertrophy for the overwhelming majority of people. It might even help it by increasing blood flow to the various Absolutely. muscles. Um, does it matter? Let's say someone's doing primarily strength and hypertrophy. Their, their primary goals are strength and hypertrophy. Yeah. And then they're going to do, they're going to hit that 150 to 180 minutes yeah. of zone two cardio per week. Assuming they're breaking that up into three or four sessions. Does it matter if they do it in the same workout before or after? Does that matter? Um, I tend to do just by way of example for people. Certainly, I'm just one uh, one example. I tend to do uh, resistance training one day, and then I'll do zone two cardio the next day. I jog because that's the thing I prefer. Then I'll uh, do strength hypertrophy training on the next day, and then and jog for my zone two cardio. And then I take one full day off a week. I've never actually done the zone two cardio on the same day, but were I to do it on the same day, would it matter if I did it before or after my my strength hypertrophy training? Not really. Okay. You're going to be just fine. The interference effects, it, the interference effect is what this is called. So this is all the way back to 1980, uh, Bob Hickman's stuff, right? And and he was actually working in a lab with John Halazi, who's one of the fa- the fathers of exercise biochemistry. And the sort of the story goes that uh, Hickman came in, he was a strength training guy, and, and Halazi and almost all those initial exercise physiologists were conditioning folks, right? So it's almost always swimmers and runners. And, and that's why a bulk of the exercise physiology historically is, is shaped in that direction. It's what those scientists were interested in. So Hickman was there in the lab and then the, how much of this is myth or not, I, who really knows, but so the story goes. Um, that this is sort of chipping back and forth and you know how from a PI to a postdoc and kind of that razzing works a little bit. And eventually he was like, you gotta start running with us. And he was like, you gotta start lifting with me and kind of goes back and forth. Well, you know who wins in that equation. It's not the postdoc, right? So it's, the PI gets in and says, Hickman says, okay, fine. So he starts running with Halazi and then eventually starts to realize I'm getting weak. I'm losing strength and like, I just can't. I think it was his bench press specifically was going down or maybe his squat. I can't remember. Who knows if it's even real, but point is. So he's going along and so eventually that like, starts to create a little bit of animosity. And it's like, actually, I don't think this is good for me and then blah, blah, blah. And so they did what any good scientist would do and said, well, let's find out, right? And so they, he run a really famous experiment where he took a group, three groups. One group did an um, endurance piece, right? The steady state cardio. One group did a strength training piece. And then the third group did both of those workouts combined. Not like a reduction, so bo- both volumes stacked on top of each other. And the results are fairly predictable in terms of the endurance group only had the greatest increases in VO2 max and endurance markers. The strength training group had the greatest increases in muscle hypertrophy. But where the interesting part was and where this whole field started was the combined group. So this is concurrent training is what it's generally called. So you're doing concurrent things. And typically that means hypertrophy and strength stacked on top of some in steady state endurance. In the same work. Same, same, same workout. Same two hour block. Or same like week. Okay. It doesn't really, it can be Got it. kind of all these. Well, the concurrent group saw the same improvements in VO2 max as the endurance group. And he's like, well, okay. So the strength training did not compromise the endurance adaptations. However, they saw much lower increases in strength and hypertrophy. And so it was, the conclusion was the addition of endurance work compromised muscle growth and strength development. However, the addition of strength training 
to your endurance work will not compromise your endurance gains. Now, that second piece has been shown countless more times, right? So if you're an endurance athlete, adding strength training is almost always going to be massively beneficial. Very little chance of detriment. This is why every endurance athlete is going to have some sort of strength and power component to their training. The controversy, though, came in the interference effect. So how much endurance training really blocks muscular development? And for years, myself included, was we preached hard. You know, don't, don't do these two things at the same time. Um, my friend, my colleague, Kevin Murek, has, has a really nice review article, Jimmy Bagley. Those two guys put this thing out. You can go read that, um, where they cover all these things, and they've got some nice figures in there. But the general answer here is, interference effect is sort of real, but it's probably greatly overblown. It matters. So are you talking about a 20-minute jog at conversation pace? That's probably doing very little. Um, with the assumption that, are you doing an eccentric-based exercise, like running? Well, then you're going to have more of an interference effect than cycling. That makes a ton of sense if mm -hmm. you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. What's your total energy intake? If you're eating sufficient calories, you can still be in an anabolic state. If the addition of extra energy expenditure, that's all it really is, more the cardio, put you in a negative energy state, it's, being, it's going to become very difficult to go through anabolism. So those things matter. Um, if you're talking about doing like, running a few laps around the track as a warm-up. Like, that's not interference effect. What we're really talking about is a big volume performed consistently. Now, after Hickman came out with this paper in 1980, people followed it up in the 90s and 2000s with mechanism. And we started to look and see, and we started to see, hey, there's this cell, cell signaling pathway that goes down to, called mTOR, and that's what leads to muscle growth. And then on the other side of that equation, there's a thing called AMPK, which is more associated with mitochondrial biogenesis and endurance. And there's this little molecule in between. At the time, most people would point to TSC2. Well, it turns out AMPK activation is fine. And if you activate mTOR, that has no bearing on AMPK. But if you activate AMPK, it's going to activate TSC2, which inhibited mTOR. And so it was like we had practical outcome, i.e. Hickman. You're going to get weaker. Now we had mechanism. So that story became very, very strong that this interference effect, and this is how science should work, right? When you mm -hmm. see mechanism match up with practical human outcome, yeah. it's a strong That's what you want. Yep. It was still wrong, though. It, it just took more science, right? And this is why we always have to give science a bit of time. And uh, you, you have to be willing to, to follow, right? And again, even me in the field who has a practitioner background and science, I felt very strongly this is a big problem. It just didn't turn out to be the case. Enough studies came out where I'm like, okay, it's probably not that big a deal. Unless the, the movement is heavily eccentric based, the volume is very high, you're trying to maximize muscle growth, and energy is not controlled. If that's not all the case, the interference effect is probably not something most people should worry about. Um, when you, Especially when you compare that against the well-roundedness that you need for total physiological health. Probably not a big deal. Very reassuring for me to hear because I do enjoy lifting weights and I really enjoy running and yeah. I, I love running outside. I believe I used to experience the interference effect when I, I used to do a very long run on Sundays. Mm. I would just go for, out for you know two hours or something yeah. like that. I don't know that I ate enough or who knows. I always feel like I eat enough or more. Uh, I love to eat. But that long Sunday run always made it hard for me to make progressive yeah. um uh, gains in strength and hypertrophy in the gym. Whereas when I cut that to 30 minutes, three or four times a week, I don't see any interference effect yeah. at all. Probably very real. And I haven't trained specifically for endurance in a very long time. So I don't, um, I haven't experienced the non-interference effect, which as you said before, most, if not all endurance athletes probably are, or at least should be doing some sort of strength work just to keep the undercarriage strong as I think. Yeah, there's a bunch called. of reasons. Yeah, yeah but yeah. So, um, 